Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome. This is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and you'll get notified when I post content each and every week. My guest is Emiliana Vegas. She is author of the new book, Let's Change the World, How to Work Within International Development Organizations to Make a Difference. Emiliana is a renowned educator and policy analyst who has spent her career focusing on improving educational opportunities in developing countries. She is a professor of practice at Harvard Graduate School of Education, and she previously served as co-director of the Center of, for Education, Universal Education at the Brookings Institute and chief of the education division at the Inter-American Development Bank. Emiliana, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edric. I'm delighted to be here. You're very welcome. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, first question, what inspired you to write a book about uh, a small subject like changing the world? Uh, was it a specific incident or uh, was it a culmination of your experiences uh, over your lengthy and distinguished career? It was a combination of both. Um, I joined the Harvard Graduate School of Education two years ago as a professor, and um, I've been teaching master's and doctoral students who want to have a career, many of them in international development. And I was struck by how um, little they knew really about how these organizations are structured, what skills they're looking for, what they actually do. And I guess the impetus came from a, a mid-career professional who has been um, working as an entrepreneur in international uh, development um, and also as a professor at Oxford University um, who met with me for coffee in January of 2022. I had just joined Harvard uh, the previous uh, summer. And we had a long conversation about how he was trying to work with people at the World Bank and at the Inter-American Development Bank um, to help produce evidence to improve learning outcomes. And he was struggling with ha understanding how these institutions really operate from the inside. And I, you know, having just spent 20 or some years in those <laughs> types of institutions, I um, was very frank. And at the end, he said, you know, you should really write a book. It would help people like me. And I just really went home and thought, why not? You know, I, I think there's a, a need for this because um, as a couple of my um uh, uh, students and colleagues here who have been reading it have said it's there's like a hidden curriculum a lot of information that is not written um but is known if you're in that space that i wanted to share with others to encourage them to join international development and make a difference in the world um uh, and that perfectly leads right to my next question because you're right many of us uh maybe don't know uh what the role of these organizations are so maybe you can describe the role that international development agencies play in the world uh, and how they work within uh, the various governments of the countries where they operate? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are many kinds of international development organizations. Um, I would say overall, their role is to help low and middle income countries, countries that are not as prosperous as the U.S., uh, advance in economic growth and also in reducing poverty. So overall, that's their mandate. And they can, they work in multiple areas. I, of course, have worked in education um, most of my career, uh, but we had colleagues who worked in health systems, in infrastructure projects, in transportation, and electricity, everything you can imagine. Um, and... Uh, they work very closely with governments, uh, especially those that are, um, well, that are uh, funded by governments and also that uh, are responsible for providing resources to low and middle income countries like the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. So you really don't go in unless the government makes an official request for assistance. That could be a loan, that could be actually technical assistance without re financial resources, because one of the interesting aspects that people don't necessarily know about these organizations is that there are a lot of uh, research that happens that is applied research to try and better understand how to solve some of the challenges that low and middle income countries face. Um, and so alongside the financial resources that are transferred 
either via loans or via grants or donations. Um, there's also a lot of um, empirical research, evidence that's being produced and technical advice that's being provided to governments. Um, we also hear the term uh, NGO or non-governmental organization. So is there a difference between the two? Are they the same thing or are there variations between a, uh, you know, an IDA versus an NGO? Yeah, there's a lot of differences. So I would say IDO in, in my book, I, I encapsulate a lot of different organizations, including some of the global non-government organizations. So let me try and describe what I mean by international development organizations. So the first sort of group are the sort of funders, and I would include their development banks in particular, like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, that are um, institutions that were founded by governments across the globe to make accessible funding at lower interest rates than would private banks to low and middle income countries. So that's one big category. There's another big category, which are private philanthropies. One of the best known and largest is the Gates Foundation here in the US, but there's also the Jacobs Foundation of which I'm proudly on the board, uh, which is a Swiss-based foundation and many other private philanthropies that provide resources in low and middle income country settings. The third group is what I call conveners. So there I would include the United Nations and other organizations like Brookings where I used to work, whose main my mandate is to set agendas and convene main stakeholders to agree on how to move forward to solve some of the most pressing development challenges. Then I call a fourth group advisors, and these are primarily think tanks and consulting firms that provide technical advice um, to both the ideals and the governments directly. And so you can think of Research Triangle Institute, where I started my career. Uh, RTI International is now known, does a lot of work uh, for the World Bank, for USAID, the US Agency for International Development, for um, governments directly to help them improve um, their programs and policies and economic growth and reduce poverty. Um, similarly, there's the large consulting firms like McKinsey, Bain and Company, et cetera. They also are in that category. And finally, I have a fifth group that I call implementers. And they are really important as well because they work alongside governments. And this is where I think you were going with the civil society organizations to implement programs on the ground. They generally have a lot of boots on the ground. They help deliver meals, help deliver, for example, teacher training programs, um, health. Uh, and so they're very important as well. Some examples could be Save the Children, um, UNICEF, and many others. Um, and thank you for that, because um, the reason I asked that question is because there are so many large geopolitical, geoeconomic organizations out there doing the work. Um, but getting it back to your book, if someone who's a person somewhere in Northern California or they're in the East Coast, and they want to make a difference, how can that one person who might feel I'm just one person, you're just you just rattled off some gigantic organizations. How can I make a difference in the world with an organization like one of the ones you mentioned? Well, the first thing I would say is, um, you know, learn more about the organizations and get the skills that I say in the book that you probably need to be attractive to them as an employee. Um, and I can describe those in a second, but I would say um, the advantage of these organizations is that they are um, large and that they have uh, a presence not only in their headquarters, let's say in the case of the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, USAID in Washington, D.C., but they have offices across the world. And so you by the by virtue of the fact that they're present in many, many countries, they have an understanding of the context, that there's people that you can work with. Um, and you, even though you're alone, I mean, I say a lot in the book and I can explain in my career, I never did anything alone. I always did some, everything with others in teams and in larger and smaller teams. But that's the beauty is that you have a platform and a group of colleagues with whom you can work to make a difference. Um, shifting now to your expertise in uh, international education, um, what are some of the, I guess, trends or most significant global trends that you've seen or experienced over the last several years in education, particularly in those areas of education in developing countries? 
So I would say that um, as a community, as, as the world as a whole, we've made immense progress in getting more and more children into school. Um, if you think about 20 years ago, many um, children in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, even in Latin America, were not attending primary or secondary schools. And today we have near 100% of children um, attending primary school and about 80% globally going to some type of secondary education. But what we've learned over this period too is that while we have been very good as an international community and, and in partnership with governments and communities in getting schools built and teachers trained and um, children attending school, we have been less effective at ensuring that all children gain the skills they need to succeed from basic literacy and numeracy to even more, um, let's say advanced um, 21st century skills. And so that's the big challenge that we're facing now as a community um, is how do we ensure that all children, and it's, it's, it's a bigger problem than it was in the past because in the past fewer children attended school and they, were, they tended to be more similar, more of privileged children to say, it, you know, uh, with more resources at home. And so now teachers are facing a, a, a variety of children, of, of learners who come with different supports at home. And it's a more challenging task for them and for the systems to deliver high quality. And when you then think about what happened in 2020, when the pandemic started in March, and then most governments, if not all across the world, decided to shut down schools um, to preserve, obviously, um, the pandemic from spreading um, even more than it did. Um, but then we've had um, countries that have had school closures for nine months to a year um, or more in some cases, and the learning losses that have taken place over this time are dramatic in most places, and they affect most the least advantaged students. Um, and so that's a major challenge that we're facing globally. Also within the US, a lot of um, data show that um, the learning losses due to the pandemic were not evenly spread. Um, they affected more people who were disadvantaged, who were attending um, low quality, low resource schools to begin with. And so there's a lot of inequality that we care about just uh, between and within countries. Um, and you, you mentioned it, I guess there are some some of those problems that are uh, global in nature. And uh, are there problems I guess you've seen in other countries that we face here in the United States? Are there subtle differences? Uh, I don't know if you've you've studied a lot here in the United States about our educational system, but it would appear that some of the things you mentioned, economics, the pandemic, maybe some of those things that we're actually experiencing here in the United States as well. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You know, I've lived in the U.S. Um, most of my adult life and uh, my children were went to U.S. schools. And so I kind of, you know, I'm a student of the U.S. system also because it provides a lot of rich evidence because it's so federal in nature. And so what one state does may be so different from another state. There's small state systems and big systems. And then you have the district level. And it's interesting because. There are countries, um, Latin America is my region of focus, that have very similar systems. So Brazil, I can think of a large education system that is very federal, where states and districts or municipalities, as they call them, run different levels of education and interact with each other. And so a lot of the challenges that the U.S. faces with inequality you know, between districts, between states, Brazil faces too. And I, I, I think Brazil has made some really interesting efforts to try and at least make some efforts to level the playing field in, in level the playing field in terms of how much each district can spend per student. Um, given that some districts are much poorer than others, they about twenty yeah about now twenty years ago, um, they started a reform that would create a, a pool of funding at the federal level and then redistribute it to guarantee that at least every system could spend a minimum floor per student. And that's something I think the US could think about. You know, we have such differences in spending per pupil between, let's say, Mississippi and DC and Massachusetts. Very well said, thank you for that. Um, one of the quotes I came across uh, of yours really struck me and I wanna ask you about it. And you said, you wrote that quote, 
My goal is to help you find ways to have a purposeful career that makes a difference in the world while also managing to have a loving family to come home to. Um, in your career, you've been able to do both. You've, you've found that balance. So how are you able to find that balance uh, between career and family? And why do you think that's so critical uh, to having purpose and meaning in your career? Yeah, I even, I would say I started very young. I come from a very traditional culture um, in South America, and I was raised by pretty traditional parents. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and yet they really believed in investing in their children's education. They believed in the transformational power of education. Um, sometimes I joke that they didn't expect what would happen once, that, <laughs> once we took off without all those educational opportunities. <laughs> but because of my upbringing, I always wanted to have a family and and be a parent and um and i was very intentional about pursuing career paths and uh, professions and opportunities that would allow me to do both and so uh, some people say well let me wait you know especially in academia and as you're starting your career some people say let me invest a lot of my early years and getting tenure for example if you're in, in an academic setting and by the time you get tenure or you get that promotion maybe you've lost that window of opportunity to to have children you know unless you plan for it and so I was I, I always knew I, I need to figure out how to do this together um, and at the same time I have to say I was very lucky because I found leaders within uh, the institutions that I worked for who who were kind of trailblazers in this regard and were committed to ensuring that, um, you know, when you work in international development, by definition, you're going to be traveling, right? So you're going to, there's built in time away from home that is part of the job. And so they made it easier for us to, when we were in headquarters in Washington in our homes, be able to spend more time uh, at home and less in the office back when remote work wasn't that popular or that you know widespread. Um, and so th those were some of the things that I benefited from. So I, I, I would say, you know, I recall, um, you know, early on, uh, early, early in the days of my career, going to my first boss after um, getting my first, you know, long-term assignment at the World Bank. And I asked him for permission essentially to leave early to take one of my children to the doctor and his response really struck me he just looked at me like why are you asking permission you just do your work do it wherever you want I don't need to know where you are or when and I thought he was a little bit crazy but at the same time you know years after I thought this was a gift that he gave me because since that time I was you know I was able to leave early to not just take my kids to the doctor but to accompany them to music classes or sports lessons or to be at parent teacher conferences and I would work from home later you know and nobody was making me feel guilty for that if anything I think the the reality is that I felt so grateful that I worked even harder you know because I felt that I owed the institution more and the best of my attention because they were giving me this possibility of being a present parent and also having a fulfilling career yeah, so my, sure. my message is really to all leaders <laughs> that um, you you bring the best out of people when you let them, when you encourage them, not let them, when you encourage them to have a life outside of work. I think that is enriching, whether it's having a family or having some hobbies. No, thank you for sharing that, because that quote struck out to me, because uh, even in my previous career, that was something that I always found value in is that you know, people have lives outside of what they do. You know, it's, you know, your occupation is not necessarily who you are. It's what you do. Who you are is everything you've talked about. You're a business person, you're a teacher, educator, family, you have, you know, so I just wanted to, to bring that out. And I appreciate you saying that uh, because it's so important to, I think, in general, having a healthy society. Thank you. Um, as we uh, get ready to close the interview, let me uh, ask you now, uh, now that the book is out and people are reading it, um, what are some of the main themes or messages that you hope people take away uh, after reading your book? Well, I think that the main message is, you know, in the past, is, is international development organizations sometimes have gotten a bad rap. Um, for example, a reputation for imposing agendas to low and middle income countries, um, for not being as sensitive to cultural differences, and on and on. Um, and 
I think there is some truth to all of that, but at the same time, they're incredibly committed individuals and, and, and an amazing mission that these institutions have. And so I guess my message is give them an opportunity. If you're someone who wants to have a, make a difference in the world and affect the lives of those who are most in need, who are people in low and middle income countries, you know, there are plenty of pathways for you to have that difference. Whether you're someone who wants to be in an implementing agency and, you know, going directly to uh, the people, or you're someone who loves working in policy design, policy analysis, um, there's room for, for all of us. And there's a need for a lot of talented people to, to join this cause. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Emiliana, thank you so much for coming on The Edric Show. Uh, if people want more information about you, uh, your book, your work at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, where can they get more information about you? I guess the best way to, uh, the best place is my personal website. It's www.emilianavegas.com. And I have links there to the book, um, to purchasing it, also to events that I'll be having in Washington, D.C., in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in New York in the coming weeks. So I look forward to seeing some of your listeners. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, congratulations on the book. Uh, I appreciate you coming on The Edric Show, and I hope I can have you on to chat again. Thank you so much, Edric. It was a pleasure. You're very welcome. This has been another edition of The Edric Show. My guest has been Emiliana Vegas. She is author of the new book, Let's Change the World, How to Work Within International Development Organizations to Make a Difference. As promised, this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people, Go ahead and hit that notification button, ring that, notif that notification bell, and you will get notified when I post content each and every week. I want to thank you for tuning in, and I will catch you on the next episode.